Welcome back to the Backside Ground Balls podcast. Super excited to be back here on the pod. My name is Trevor Powers, and I am joined by my co-host, Dan Galati. To everybody that listened to the last episode, we apologize about the technical difficulties. For whatever reason, it was not coming in on my end and my audio, so I couldn't hear what Dan was saying. Then I went to edit the podcast, and I could hear everything Dan was saying. So what we're going to try to do is, if that happens this time, I'm going to become like John Boy. I'm going to read Dan's lips, and we're just going to basically play a game where I'm just going to guess what he had to say and also hope it's not on the delay so we're not waiting for an extended period of time, and we're going to see how it rolls. Dan, how does that sound? Can't wait to see how this episode goes off the rails and where we fall off technically. You would think 150-some-odd episodes in, we'd have this ironed out, but here we sit, and uh, who knows? Are you a... uh, you a Scotty Scheffler fan? Yeah, love Scotty. He seems like the the ultimate good dude. Um, just seems genuine. Doesn't seem like he he didn't come up with a a ton of fanfare. I guess when he was young, like he wasn't like a prodigy, and he's just like a dude. Um, and he he seems like a good person, which is all I genuinely care about about athletes. Is are you a good person, and and then I'll root for you. Yeah, I really think I'm in the uh, I'm in the minority. I, something about him rubs me the wrong way. I don't disagree with what you just said, though. Seems like such a good person. Yeah. Like, seems like a good person. Seems like a good guy. Really good at golf. You you know the comp? Andrew Luck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, won a lot more, but yeah. Won a lot more, <laughs> yes. But, like, you, like, it would not shock me if Scotty Scheffler was just, like, 29 years old and was just like, you know what? I'm just going to turn this golf thing into a hobby. Yeah. That, I, I can see that. I mean, I, the comp is, a, I think, a strong one. Like, good guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, very white. <laughs> fair. That's, that's <laughs> extremely fair. Extremely fair. But for any of those that do not follow golf, um, Scotty Scheffler just wrapped up his second Masters Championship uh, at 27 years old. He's, In three years. I think, the th- third youngest um, to be under 27 or with uh, – the territory of Tiger Woods and Jack Nicholson. So uh, that'll be that'll be good. So uh, let's Nicholas. talk. I know Nicholas, we're not a golf sorry. podcast. But yeah, exactly. There we go. That's why we're a Masters. we're going into our strengths now. Brendan Murphy, you can give me some grief about that botching that um, as I talked about that and so, tried to Wyatt transition, hasn't but hit a homer yet. He's got bigger things. To, he's got bigger fish to fry. All right, so let's get into Weekend 9 recap across college baseball. There was a ton of stuff that happened across this weekend. Coming into the weekend, I guess it was a little bit of a lighter slate, um, but there were definitely some upsets. Um, A couple in particular that we're not going to dive deep into is NC State winning the series against Clemson, which is going to create some movement, not only in the ACC, but also in the top 25. And then also there were a couple South Carolina taking down Florida as Florida continues to reel in the wrong direction. Um, And just a lot of really good baseball, West Virginia taking down UCF as UCF creeped into the rankings and just a ton of, of series that we didn't exactly see coming. But, Dan, I got a couple quick hitters for you um, before we get going into these breakdowns of what we saw this past weekend. So the first, after this weekend, will we see a new number one at the top of the rankings? Yeah, I think you're going to see most places um, jump Texas A&M above Arkansas and Clemson. Okay. Fair. Both were upset this weekend in things we didn't expect to see happen. So that's that's big deal. Um, so with that question, we've had this conversation a lot off air. A lot of people have asked and this year, you know, last year we felt like going into at least the the, the College World Series and the regionals, we had a pretty good sense of who the top teams in the country were, or at least who the most complete teams were in the country. Who in your opinion, is the most complete team as we enter week 10 in college baseball. Here's the thing about this is because no matter who I say, it's going to, they're going to completely fold down the stretch. Yeah, that's true. So like I, I think, I think Texas A&M, I like, I really still like Arkansas, but Arkansas's offense just hasn't, I thought we were heading in the right direction. And we'll get into this in a little bit. 
didn't look great this weekend. Tennessee is offensively is unbelievable. The pitching staff is getting better. They're trending in the right direction. I think you have an argument. The, the folks in Knoxville have an argument. I think Clemson has a little bit of an argument. Uh, Clemson, not so much. Like, it's complete, too. It, like, that's the thing. Because you're not, like, the star power for Clemson, especially on the mound, it isn't there. There aren't a lot of names that everyone knows or recognizes. But we've said it a million times that Clemson has depth on the mound that gets the job done. They just know how to win games. Does that make them complete? Maybe their offense, again, like outside of Canarella. It's Texas. I, I guess just I think we're setting this up, so I'll say Texas a and I think Texas A&M right now has the argument to not only be number one, but also has the argument that they are the deepest and most complete team, not deepest, sorry, the most complete team in the country at the moment. I mean, when you look at what the – you know, the guys at the front of the rotation have done. That offense is a nightmare to get through. The bullpen's done a good job. I, I, as we sit right now, Texas A&M, so sorry to everyone down at College Station because things are probably going to take a, a terrible turn now that I've said that. That's what, I, that's what I was thinking as we were prepping for this episode. I was like, we're really going to put a test to the backside ground balls curse and, and see how bad this thing is because everybody we've anointed as the deepest and best team in the country has proceeded to go into the next week and lose. So another question that maybe, depending on, on your opinions, might surround Texas A&M and the Aggies as well Transfer portals become such a big part of, of college baseball. We've seen additions across the SEC, across top 10 programs, and they that have made an impact. Transfer portal is going to open up on tax day, April 15th, as this comes out to our listeners. Who has been the most impactful transfer portal addition this season? I think there's a lot of guys that, could, that, you, that have a case in this. Um, if Florida wasn't 18 and 17, Colby Shelton had got off to a great start. Looked like it could be him. Um, I think you could argue that Chase Burns is up there because of just kind of the singular performance of what he's done. The problem with, for me, when you look at it, is who's had the biggest impact. Chase Burns pitches one out of every four games a week. Uh, so, like, it's hard to, you know, it's like voting for a pitcher for MVP. Um, in, in Major League Baseball, where they're only making 30-some starts. So it's tough to say that they are the most impactful, most valuable. Same thing with, with my feeling here when I'm talking about Chase Burns, because he's been – look, he's been fantastic. And you could absolutely make an, a, a claim that he is the most impactful. Um, but, again, sticking with the theme of where we're heading with this, I mean, I don't know how anyone – like again, there's you could argue there are a lot of guys. Me saying Braden Montgomery shouldn't cause too much argument from anyone. No, it would not. It would not. And I think that that shows a lot of the conversation that we're going to have today um, is going to be centered around the Aggies of Texas A and M. But I do want to do a quick question. I was perusing some schedules here, right? I would say at this point last year, we were pretty confident that at least one of the three of Wake Forest, LSU, and Florida, a little bit of question marks around LSU at this point last year, were going to be the, the last team standing. Let's just say hypothetically we're looking at the field outside of the top teams that have kind of been mentioned a lot as national championship contenders. Is there any team that you have specifically circled that you think could, this could be the year that they make a run and we get the surprise um, national champion that we weren't expecting on April 15th? I've been talking for 30 seconds on mute. You got me. Um, so I, I was this, wondering if the this, mute button got you. I appreciate you letting it play out. Um, so this is, this is, uh, this feels like a year, right? Like outside of kind of, I still think this, the, the three best teams to me right now are, are Arkansas, A&M and, and Clemson in some order. I think, you know, like you said, and, and Tennessee, I think is, is absolutely in that conversation and you feel good about that. So even, 
that's could only be half the field in Omaha if they take care of business. So there's going to be some unexpected things that go on. And a lot of teams can make a run. A lot of ACC teams that come to mind, you know, Florida State, Wake Forest, North Carolina could all absolutely make runs. Vanderbilt can still be there at the end of the year. Um, so I, it's weird. But for me, I think I'm just going to take this question a different way. I'm going to say ECU. And I know that that probably feels weird, but this almost feels like one of those years where a, a small school can go on a run. We can see kind of one of these, you know, these teams standing at the end. Now, will it happen? I don't know, but I think we, this, like, a, it's not the hottest of takes. ECU is ranked ninth in the country right now. They just got done throwing two no hitters in the same week, um, but they've taken care of business for the most part, right? Like they, 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 they beat the teams they should. They had that huge series win against North Carolina, which North Carolina has the best record in the ACC right now. ECU has a series win against them under their belt. And again, like you said it, why does North Carolina have the best record in the ACC? It's because they don't lose to teams that they, they shouldn't. Okay, that's fine. They're still a really good team. They're still a team that I you know you'll, we'll probably see in a super regional. I would expect to see Carolina in a super regional. ECU took a series from them. They have the ace, right? They have the guy that could be a first-round draft pick on the mound. That, to me, is so important down the stretch. Will they have the depth of arms, guys that can start, you know, games three, four, five in a week? Will they have the bullpen guys to get there? I don't know, but I like the offense. It's loaded with left-handed hitters, which I think can cause some of these teams problems um, unless you have a Hagen Smith um, or even like a Josh Hartle when you get into the playoffs. But I'm going to go with ECU just because it feels like a year where it's been really hard. We've gone back and forth on who are the t best 10 teams in the country. We don't know. ECU has just continued to win baseball games. ECU continues to look good. Um, they, they have an interesting end to the season. They're going to get a couple uh, more – opportunities against ACC teams. They still have Duke and NC State in the midweek slate coming up. So I'm, I'm excited to see those games, see how they handle business there. Uh, and unfortunately, since I just said ECU, they're probably going to slide here out the rest of the way. What if I told you that my team that I want to choose for this conversation has losses on the year to Washington State, two losses – to Kennesaw State, one loss to Missouri, one loss to Samford, and then I'm missing a loss somewhere as I was scanning through the through their record. Would you believe me that I thought that that team could win a national championship? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think uh, – go ahead. State your case. The Kentucky Wildcats. The Kentucky Wildcats are sitting at 14-1 and in the SEC. They handled their business against an Alabama team that we thought was reeling coming into the weekend that just handled their business against Arkansas. They took down Auburn, and, man, Auburn has had a meat grinder of a start to the season. They took down Ole Miss when Ole Miss was riding hot and had some momentum. Georgia, same situation where they were riding hot and had some momentum there. They're currently sitting at 30-5. and 30 and five as a team. Now I will say the SEC slate gets a lot harder. They play host to Tennessee. They had to Columbia, South Carolina. They play host to Arkansas. They had to Florida and they play host to Vanderbilt to end their season. So again, that sounds like more losses than 14 and one in the SEC. But you talk about a team that has absolutely handled their business up until this point, And we haven't exactly done a deep dive on their roster or what they have because they've kind of sneaked up, sneak up, snuck up on everybody up to this point through the year, but it's a team that does it in different ways, right? Right now, currently they're 77 for 97 on stolen bases, hitting 291 as a team, 47 home runs, more doubles. They have 75 doubles as a club. They're not a team that's going to go out there and just absolute bang. They're going to manufacture runs. They like to bunt, which give or take what, how your opinion is on, on whether that's valuable or not, but they seem to execute at a high level and they pitch it, pitch into a three, six, five as a staff striking out less batters per inning. But again, it's just one of those teams. That's a club that does a lot of things the right way. And they play the game the right way, depending on uh, who you ask. And that's something that I think this is going to be the year where we could see the team that makes the least amount of mistakes 
become the team that is standing there at the end of the year because it just feels like each and every team has had that roadblock and that hiccup. And again, remember, we're talking about teams outside of that Arkansas, you know, Texas A&M, even the teams that have struggled this year that we expected to be really good. Um, I think a team that makes no mistakes is going to find themselves deep into the playoffs and, and deep into Omaha. Not necessarily saying winning a national championship, but I think if they can play clean baseball in June, they're going to be in a good spot. What if I were to tell you I would set their – I would set it at, at 0. 0.5 series wins the rest of the way, the over-under? I would take the over. <laughs> You're looking at Florida and South Carolina is my assumption? Just in general, like what we've seen in the SEC this year, like I, I would, I don't even want to like sit there and say either or anybody or anything in general, just because of the fact that um, it, that's tough to kind of handicap that there are going to be series losses in there, but there's also going to be unexpected series wins. Like again, I mentioned Kentucky's five losses and they've also played teams like Ole Miss, Georgia, Alabama, and Auburn. And they are combined 12 and 0 against those teams. But God forbid M Missouri comes into your place on a, on a Saturday and you don't, you don't trip up and fall. So I would say they at least get one the rest of the way, at least one. Um, I would even probably alt line it to one and a half and just assume that they're playing again. Like we've talked about it with Florida. Could they get swept by Florida? 100%. Anybody could get swept by Florida with how much talent that team has, but God forbid Florida doesn't want to play that weekend. And next thing you know, Kentucky, they're not going to kick the ball around. They're not going to give away a series and they're going to be in a good spot to win. Well, I think the interesting thing too, that you have to look at with like, I, I, I would still say, one of one for five here the rest of the way in series would be my would be my guess here and, and I would look at those two teams starting with South Carolina and Florida but I think the interesting thing that we're going to see here is the the thing that we've talked about a lot of times on here especially when we're dealing with college kids and confidence is key like if you get confident kids like there is nobody in that program in Lexington right now any of those players one through 40 on that roster who don't believe they're the best team in the country. They feel like they yeah. can beat anybody right now. They're like you said, they're 30 and five. They've been dominating sec play. The hardest, you know, conference is what everybody says. The hardest conference in the country. They've rolled through it. They've ripped through it. They only have one loss on the year. You see teams like Arkansas losing series. They're the number one team in the nation. Kentucky hasn't lost a series. You know, you see LSU and Florida stumble. You see Vanderbilt stumble. It's like I, the, you can't convince me that if you walked in that locker room and you said and you took a poll in there and said, "You guys, best team in the country," every single one of them would say yes. Every single one of them are riding high, so I think that also can help them a little bit because they are so. It's almost one of those things where people say, you know, they're they're too young to understand, they're, they're too young and stupid, because yep. they just like you. I bet you you can't tell them the flaws that they have. I bet you you can't tell them that they haven't played their hardest part of their schedule yet. They know that these are going to be big series, but to these guys, they've all probably been big series. You know, going to Auburn and sweeping, they don't care that Auburn's now 3-12. and 12. That was a big deal to them, right? Going to Ole uh -huh. Miss and sweeping. They don't care that Ole Miss is – I think there were 6-8 and eight in conference now or something like that. They don't care that that Ole Miss, you know, is below 500. They went out there and, they, you know, they kicked their butts. And and for them, I think that will help them a lot, and, and we we see it all the time. When you get college kids that are just confident, a little bit cocky, and, and – and just kind of believe that, hey, we're really good. We think we are. We know we are. We believe we are. They go play loose. They go play relaxed. They could They could win this. I also think just because of what we've seen a little bit, I think being at home against, you know, for three of those series, you know, there are only two – the road series there are South Carolina and um, Florida. So you get – you get you avoid having to go to Rocky Top. You avoid having to go to Baum Walker. You avoid having – to go to Vanderbilt, that at least helps them a little bit. You get all three of those yeah. teams coming to your place where you could sucker punch these teams. Because I, oh, yeah. I, I, the thing though is, at this point, at fourteen and one in conference, there's a target on their back. No one's. Oh like, yeah. None of these, like Tennessee, this weekend is not gonna gonna head to Kentucky thinking, oh, it's Kentucky. Like that's a rivalry. That's a, you know, it's a border war. That's a. Those are two teams that that typically don't like each other. Tennessee knows they're fourteen and one. Tennessee believes they're really good too. That's gonna be that's gonna be an interesting series and it'll be a good test. 
Yeah, and we we can dive into Kentucky's roster and, and what they've been able to do this year, obviously, because that's going to be one of the top series heading into this weekend because it could probably potentially be two top five programs in the country. I mean, depending on how the shakeup is and depending on what publication you follow, there's definitely going to be an argument to be made for Kentucky to be top five um, in the country. Let's head down to College Station to talk about this series as Texas A&M, who's currently sitting at 32 and four with a 24 and one record at home, absolutely handled the Commodores of Vanderbilt. They won 15 to 0 in a mercy rule seven inning convincing fashion. Then they knocked Carter Holton out on Saturday early to, to the tune of a 9 nothing victory. Obviously, extreme length out of their starting pitching. Ryan Prager went seven shutout innings, complete game on Friday, saved the bullpen. Tanner Jones went seven and a third shutout innings, saved the bullpen again. And then in 12-6 to six on Sunday, um, one convincing fashion to sweep the series. When we talk about Texas A&M, we're going to talk about the club specifically. But I'm starting to really feel like this is the best home environment when they're playing good baseball in the country and they make it a nightmare on opposing pitchers. And there's nowhere you would want to be as a guy struggling to find the strike zone than College Station in June in a regional is all I could think watching the games this weekend. Just that, that is, that is so bad. Um, yeah, the, the, the Vanderbilt's pitching. I mean, it, like you said, going into that place and having to pitch in high, like, like just high leverage situations, conference series, regional super, as you get further into the season, is really tough. Add in the fact, the guys that you have to get through, <laughs> like that walk up to the plate in A&M's lineup that you then have to navigate through makes it even a, a, a steeper challenge. Um, and like you said, as we get deeper into this, as we get into June, that atmosphere is just going to continue to just con- uh, be louder, be more intense, be more, um, you know, be tougher to to navigate and, and perform in. And I just, it's so impressive to me, this lineup, like that's why when you say most complete to me, like just looking at this lineup, this is the type of college offense that we've gotten accustomed to over the last couple of years winning a national championship, right? You look at the guys that were in that LSU lineup that were anchored by Cruz and White, and you look at, you know, even the teams that, that they, you know, even the Florida team that they had, they played to win the national championship that had Cags and Wyatt Langford. This lineup has that type of star power. This lineup is like just before you even get to Jackson Appel, it's like just brutal. The top three is, in my opinion, probably the best top three in the country right now, as far as just how dynamic those guys are at controlling the strike zone putting the barrel to the ball and doing complete and total damage gaps, extra base hits, hitting the ball over the yard. And if you go in there and like, that's what makes it even tougher is because of the fact that all three of those guys and really everyone in this A&M lineup will take a walk. Um, Now, I think the most impressive thing to me was like Vanderbilt came out and tried to attack, right? Bryce Cunningham, they walked two guys on Friday night, two, two guys on Friday night. Saturday was a completely different story. They were a little bit uncompetitive in the zone, uh, Vanderbilt on Saturday. But Friday, they only walked two guys. It's just everybody in the lineup goes for for multi-hit, has a multi-hit game, and that's how you get 15 hung on you because if you are going to be competitive in the zone, your stuff better be you know your best stuff that night or else they're just going to do damage. You're going to hit balls over the yard. They're going to hit balls in the gap. They're going to continue to just, you know, they, they do kind of everything. And then, you know, we'll get into this in a second, but then you got like – and then it's hard to score off of them. So, like, you constantly have to feel like you're chasing against Texas A&M because it's like you feel like every single – it probably feels like every inning one of those three guys is coming to the plate. And you're like, again, I thought we just got through this part of the order. And they're back up. And then there's a quick inning by, you know, by Prager or, or any of these, you know, other arms that have thrown the ball so well for A&M. And it's just – it's miserable, especially like you said, you know, going to – College Station right now is is not easy. No, my palms get sweaty when they start chanting ball four. I'm not going to lie. But like if I like you could see, I mean, you talked about them struggling to find the strike zone on Saturday. Like it 
it impacted Holton. Like it did. And that's a dude who's pitched in very, very important games in his college career that he had, he was very obviously impacted by the crowd and they love that. And obviously that just gets the crowd more engaged and more into it. But I mean, when you talk about this Texas A&M team, and I want to talk about the pitching as much as anybody, right? Because that's been the highlight. This is a team that last year in Coach Schlossnagel's second season, that's where their struggle was, right? They they struggled a little bit in with the pitching, and it's taken a huge step forward. But you can't get far into talking about this team without talking about the three-headed monster of Brady Montgomery, Jace LaViolette, and Gavin Grohavik. That trio has 19 home runs for Montgomery. Laviolette has 16 and Grohovic has 13. Like that's, and that's far and away, like leading the club, right? When we look at, and we'll look at Tennessee's lineup in a minute. When you look at their lineup, it's more spread out and it's more one through nine. This is a three headed monster that has to put so much fear in pitchers. And I mean, Friday was a great example of, Brady Montgomery had two home runs. LaViolette had two home runs. The rest of the lineup did what they needed to do. Next thing you know, 15 runs are up on the board. LaViolette had two home runs early in the game to kind of put the game away. Montgomery had a couple later in the game. It's just one of those things where it's like you cannot compete with guys that are that good, like just dynamic talents. And it's it's really impressive because what they've been able to do as an offense has been centered around what those three are able to do. And the rest of the pieces now, instead of being, and I mean, imagine this team without Brady Montgomery. And LaViolette, not saying he struggled. It was more of just like, Homer bust kind of stretch for a little bit there as his average dip below 300 for a really dynamic hitter. But if they didn't have the addition of Brady Montgomery this year, I mean, you, you talked about it in the most important transfer edition. I mean, they would be a completely, completely different lineup because they'd be re- relying on true freshman Gavin Grohovic, who has been great. That's awesome, but still a true freshman And then LaViolette, who's had the highs and lows of the season, but seemed to get on a heater this past weekend. So Brady Montgomery has been absolutely huge for this offense that has followed suit to the tune of a 307 as a club uh, with 73 home runs, with the majority of them coming from those three. And just just real quick before we can start, you know, if you want to start talking about their pitching just on those threes, like they've also combined for 90 walks. Yeah. 89 walks. Like, it's like, and that's my point. It's like, so, so again, it's like, okay, you want to be careful with those three. They're going to take their wall. They're not necessarily going to like, you know, Montgomery and LaViolette are basically, you know, one to one strike out to walk. Grohovic, who's a true freshman, you expected it's about two to one strike out to walk. That's fine, but he's still taking his 21 walks. The other two are in the mid thirties. Like, it's just yeah. like, it's, it's insane. Like, that's what makes it so tough when not only when these guys can, when you can impact the baseball the way they do, hit for the power. I mean, they, and then take the wall, be patient, be unselfish and not go up there and like, I'm going to be the guy to do it. No, I'll take the walk and you got to go through the next guy. And then to have after that, like you get through those three and then you have Jackson uh, Appel hitting in the four hole who's hitting 358 himself. Like, so it's just yep. like, just, you can just go through that entire lineup. And that, again, when we start to talk about who are these teams at the top, that's what Arkansas is missing. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And that's why you start to build the, the perception that Texas A&M can and will be a contender late in Omaha, especially with the, with the coach that they have there, who's been there on basically a biannual basis when he was at TCU. And it feels like he's always taken really good teams deep into Omaha. Like that was just kind of common for, for coach lost and what he's done. So speaking of coach lost maybe the most important off season addition was the addition of pitching coach Mash Weiner combined as a staff we mentioned this they're pitching to a 3.14 they have 414 strikeouts 109 walks in 315 innings it's led by ryan prager who missed all of last year due to an injury he entered the florida start rolling he had it at zero earned runs on the year was punching out more way more than a batter per inning there was a hiccup there, right? Six earned runs against a really good Florida team. Wind was blown out. He's not a guy that overpowers hitters. He's been good 
ever since. Solid start against Mississippi State. Okay start against Auburn. Okay start against South Carolina. Well, he looked like the Prager that was at the beginning of the season through the first four starts that he had. He had seven strike or ten strikeouts against Vanderbilt in seven innings pitch with zero walk. I mean, this is a guy who's walked five batters on the year. And just collectively as a pitching staff outside of Prager, what they've been able to do this season has just been unreal. I mean, the fact the production that they're getting on the mound and how knowing the offense that they have, they're able to keep them in every game. And if they can keep teams off the board the way they kept Vanderbilt off the board this year, it's like the, the sky's the limit for this club. I mean, this is a team that pitched to a five, six, seven last year and walked about a half or 320 batters in, in 566 innings. So like a ton of batters. And just to see the complete 360 from this club with a lot of the same names is just a credit to what, what Weiner has been able to do in his first season, first season in college baseball this year. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And that's, again, this is kind of what you build the confidence from as you watch, you know, we talked about the frontline guys. You talk about Tanner Jones, you talk about Prager and Prager. I mean, like you said it, you, you mentioned it, but 73 strikeouts to five walks and 50 innings is like, that's unbelievable. Like that's a guy like he, we should be talking a lot more about him and what he's been able to do. He's, he's pitching, he has a .76 whip. I mean, his numbers are absolutely insane. And as a whole, uh, at the pitching staff, like when you look, when you get past those guys, Lampkin kind of had a dud today. And luckily, when you get a guy who can't go deep in game three, goes an inning and two-thirds, gives up four runs, what, you, you got to turn to the bullpen. Well, the first two guys save the bullpen. Brager goes seven. We mercy rule. We don't have to play anymore. So he goes complete game. Next game, we use our best guy to close it out in a 9 nothing game, an inning and two-thirds, Evan Ashenbeck. And then we'll, so we'll just bring him right back to save game three. And in between, the bridge guy in between is going to be Chris Cortez, and he's going to give us four. He's pitching to a 2-3-2. He's got 47 strikeouts and 31 innings. So when you look at it, it's like they have the starting pitching. They have the two really good relievers that they rely on a lot. Um, Brad Rudis is another guy that, you know, I think 12 appearances this year, he's got a sub on the RA. They have the pieces, right? Like we talked about Clemson's depth of the bullpen. A&M can match it. They've had guys that they've been very successful with. Like you said, the credit to the coaching staff and to the players for buying in and making the adjustments to come back and be this much better year over year is really impressive. Yeah, and they, they deserve all the credit in that that club. And, and Cortez is a guy that, from a bullpen standpoint, I mean, you're talking about 97 and 99 with bowling ball level sink, um, who's going to be a guy that can dominate any lineup across the country. So this team... What they've been able to do, super impressive. Um, they're probably, probably most likely going to be the number one team in the country entering next weekend. Um, in the SEC, you have no easy. There's no uh, walks in the park. There's no easy series. So you know they're going to have the opportunity to drop some games. They're probably going to have a hiccup or two. Um, they're going to head or they're going to play host or head to Alabama, who's obviously coming off a great weekend as they took the series from Arkansas, giving Arkansas their first series loss on the year. Again, Arkansas, we've talked about this ad nauseum, it feels like. Arkansas's biggest Achilles heel of this team is going to be the offense. And it came, and it it bit them in the butt. They only scored eight runs across the series. And that is fine when Hagen Smith pitches. Right when Hagen Smith goes out there, and this is a guy that's going to dominate any lineup in the country, by all means, you can score eight runs across the series. But when five of those runs came in the first three innings of a Hagen Smith start off of a really good starter in Ben Hess, and then you completely go down to shutdown mode, it raises a lot of question marks about what this team's ceiling can be. Their pitching is going to keep them in every game, series, anything across the board, but you still have to put runs on the board to win, and you're also going to face high-level pitching at some point. So really, alarm bells are going off right now, at least in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's tough to swallow. When, when, you, when your starting pitchers give you 17 innings across a series and only give up three runs, you expect to win the series, right? Like we gave up three earned runs. as Our three starters gave up a combined three earned runs – we should at least be two and one, right? And now the bullpen struggled a little bit, but they only gave up seven earned in 10 innings. You know, we've seen a lot worse. You see a lot worse all the time out of bullpens in college baseball. You see 
uh, bullpens give up seven earned in one game a lot in college baseball. So yeah, they had you know they pitched 10, 10 innings and they and they gave up seven runs. Okay, that happens. You should still have won this series. I, I, yeah, we knew this was going to happen though. I think we've kind of hinted at this was the concern. You know, and like I said, I was hoping that Arkansas's offense was heading in the right direction. They'd flash some signs. Peyton Stovall had come back and been phenomenal. You were hoping that they were going to turn the corner. Um, this is a little bit concerning. I still think I, – I just think this was the hiccup that should have happened earlier in the year. And it finally – they finally got bit on the road against an Alabama team who really, really, really needed this series. They looked like they were kind of trending in the wrong direction a little bit. So this was kind of Alabama you, – you went in and you had an Alabama team with their backs against the wall. And credit to Alabama for doing a good job and, and – winning the series and, and keeping Arkansas's offense at bay. I don't know how alarmed I am, though, just from the standpoint of that pitching staff giving up three runs across 17 innings. They're going to win the rest. If they do that the rest of the the season, they're going to win those series because Arkansas has found a way to score the runs necessary to win those series all year up until this point. If you want to start getting into postseason play, if we were previewing regionals and supers and, and the World Series, I would say, look, th- this is why I, I have some concern about Arkansas. They have a handful of series left now to get it right. Hopefully we start to see some of the signs we were seeing from the offense um, leading up to this point the last few weeks moving forward here. And then, you know, I'm, I'm not ready yet to to kind of ring the alarm on my end. But if we continue to see this, look, if you're getting – again, you can't score eight runs. You can't do it. Like you got to be better than that. In this, in this era of college baseball, the ball, the way it flies, the way we teach hitting, we need more than eight runs uh, uh, for me to be confident that you're going to be standing at the end. Do they have the guys to do it? I don't it? know. I don't know. That's been the question the whole time, right? Like you feel like you feel like maybe. With, at what point here, forty games in? Are we like, well, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, they definitely have talent. That's that's Arkansas, right? They've never been short on talent. We see it on the mound. They have talent. Guys like Kendall Diggs, Peyton Stovall, Sprague Lott, I mean, Wahiwa Aloy, like McLaughlin. Like, there's guys that can play. It's just – so maybe it is. Yeah, I, I, I think the Aloy – I think they were putting a lot of their chips in the Aloy basket and – while he's talented and dynamic, he's still young. Nine home runs on the year. Strikeouts are a little bit of a problem. Doesn't walk a ton. Like those ratios aren't great. But I mean, it was expected. He was coming from the whack where he hit 370, and 370 in the whack doesn't exactly translate to 370 in the SEC. His power numbers have gone up, which is good. So, but I, I think he was expecting him to be like. SEC first team all conference guy is probably a next year thing and probably a realistic next year thing. There's no doubt about that. It's just outside of that, it's 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 underwhelming. I mean, 276 as a club, 52 home runs on the year. You don't really run. You don't really leave the yard as much as these other top teams that we're talking about. And again, Alabama was in wounded animal mode, so it's credit to them for showing up, especially after having their ace knocked around for five earned in five innings. And and when you lose those games, when you're talking about having a first round arm on the mound, it's it's tough to recover from. Um, and especially when you don't exactly come out and beat the starting pitchers up ever um, in another start. So showed battle tested, really impressed with, with what coach Vaughn has, has been able to do with that club in his first year. But I mean, you tell me, you think this is Arkansas, Arkansas lost this series more than Alabama won this series, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we might be not giving Alabama's pitching staff the credit they deserve. Here. Yeah, they're. I mean, they did a great Ferone job. Did but. really good on Saturday, and then obviously on Sunday as well. Zane Adams came out and was was really good. Yes, but but I I kind of feel the same way you do. Like it's like just because of kind of the expectations of Arkansas, and and what their pitching staff set up for them. Like again, you kind of bear the responsibility of being, you know, the presumed best team in the country. And that comes with expectations. And the expectations are when you get the pitching that Arkansas gets weekend in and weekend out, the offense has to produce. And you would think, like you said, they, they did put a lot of eggs in the uh, Alloy basket and they put a lot of eggs in Jared Sprague lot. You know, it's another transfer that 
They expect a lot from him. And he's he's answered the bell a little bit. But, like, we just need more. Like you said, what is this offensive identity? What do they do? They don't really they don't really bang it around the yard. They don't really run. They don't really walk. They don't really put pressure on They don't really hit for high average. That's what I'm saying. They don't really they, – they swing and miss. Like, so it's like I just – they just kind of feel like bunt. a blah offense. <laughs> right. Like, they, what do they do? I don't know what Arkansas's offensive identity is. And so then you that you ask the question, well, do they have the guys? I don't know. I don't know if they do. You know, you know the names because they play at Arkansas. You know where they come from. You know the track record of some of these guys. I, I don't know if they have enough to get it done. Again – it can continue to get better because of the talent that you know they have. They are talented. Mm-hmm. Those kids are talented. But we're, we're 35 games in. So is this just kind of who they are? Are they going to have to just pitch it to get there? I don't know. I don't know. They could probably do it. They're going to get a really good draw because they're going to be one of the top three seeds most likely if they finish the year the way they've played up to this point. They'll be a top three seed. They'll get a favorable draw. So that could help them because they could use the pitching to get there. We'll see. Yeah, and I guess all things considered, if if they get assuming they get to Omaha, you get in the spacious confines, you're gonna want to be pitching anyway. And and we've seen too many teams that rely a lot on offense and specifically offense at some smaller parks when you get into the to the bowels of Omaha and try to get leave the yard there it just doesn't happen and and offenses kind of go there to die so I guess there's this silver lining there and I mean the talent is there there's no doubt about that but I'll be interested to see it again maybe I came out a little hot and heavy and then I'm sitting there going they're 30 and 5 they're 12 and 3 in the SEC they've won every series that they're supposed to win they're allowed to have hiccups. They're allowed to have roadblocks. When we were talking about LSU at this point last year, it was a lot of question marks about everybody except for Paul Skeens, um, and they went on to win the national championship. So I'm not completely writing off this Arkansas club, but I do think that there's some truth to the fact that they just offensively, they don't, don't look good. Don't They don't look good to the eye test. They don't look good to the stat nerds. They don't look good to anybody. Like, it's just, it's not what you envision of like a truly dynamic, complete team, especially when comparing them to other teams across the SEC. Like one in particular, Tennessee Volunteers. Tennessee Volunteers, they've come into this year. They've had a lot of turnover. They lose Chase Burns and everybody thinks, whoa, what, what's kind of, What's that all about? Why would he leave? He felt like a good situation. He felt like he was going to be the guy as Dolander went off to the MLB draft and he just gets on the first flight out of town. He was touring some schools and and wanted to get out of there. Offense had some turnover as well with a lot of guys heading to the the next level. It was a team last year that obviously we had mentioned several times came out the gate slow. We compare a lot of teams this year to them. We're questioning whether – their opponent LSU was going to be like that where we're, Oh, we're still going to see this team in Omaha. Obviously they've trended in a different direction. Tennessee hasn't exactly played the toughest FCC schedule. They've had some, some tough series to play. They have some impressive wins throughout the year, but it hasn't been the gauntlet that some of these other teams have faced. It's only going to get harder from here. They go to Kentucky face Missouri, who gave them problems last year, Florida, Vanderbilt, South Carolina to end out their uh, season. But this is a team that, as it stands right now, is sitting at 30 and 6, 10 and 5 in conference play. They're 25 and 2 at home on a six game winning streak. And they just got Billy Amick back, who's been one of their most productive players. And they could still use for a little bit of, of addition from guys that are still on the injured reserve. But Just an impressive weekend from them as they swept LSU again. What is LSU? I I don't know. I I can't at this point I can't tell you. Just not really a very good team, I guess is what I would say. But still sweeping the reigning national champions on your home turf. Um that's impressive nonetheless. I'm so tired of talking about LSU. They're 20, so am I. What is LSU? They're 22. Well, you know when we're not going to have to talk about them. 12 in conference. So, you know when we're not going to have to talk about them, Dan? <laughs> no, sorry. In June. <laughs> we're not going to have to talk about them. So. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, look, Tennessee's offense. You want to know how you, you, you said it. Like, those offensive turnover and Chase Burns was transferring. And, you know, a year after they went to Omaha, and, and, um, 
They went on that run. They had been really we've, – we've mentioned this before. You know, they've been one of the most talked about teams for the last two years. And then uh, a lot of those guys left. It kind of – it was a tr- almost like a – felt like a transition year a little bit. And then – they slugged 657. I don't know what else to really say about them. They slugged 657 as a team. And, like, the, they have, what, five regulars and double di- with double-digit home runs? Five or six guys with double-digit home runs? Five, yes. They're ridiculous. I, I mean, and, and Blake Burke is unbelievable. Billy Amick, like, just all of them. The, the, we talked about how tough it was to face the guys in A&M's lineup and get through it. And I know Tennessee's yards play small, but like you look at Tennessee's lineup and it's like, well, how do you navigate through this one? And that's what they do. They consistently put pressure on you. They've allowed their pitching staff to kind of figure things out a little bit. Drew Beam got off to a slow start. A.J. Russell's been out. They the, Because the offense is so good, they didn't miss a beat. They allowed the pitching staff to kind of round into form. And just this is just kind of what you saw last year. We got to the midway point. The offense wasn't nearly as successful last year at this point, but the pitching staff was kind of like they – they hadn't figured it out. We moved Chase Burns to the bullpen. We shuffled the rotation around. They took off, and, and next thing you know, they were playing late in June. It kind of feels this way with the pitching staff again for Tennessee, where it's like they have the injury to Russell. What's Drew Beam going to be? We need to shuffle things around. We need to figure out who slots into what role. And credit to Tony Vitello, because it seems like at this time, every year, Tennessee just can starts to take off, right? Like pitching – Pitching an offense come together, they start playing their best ball, which again, we say it all the time on here. The coach cliche of this is, you know, we want to be playing our best ball in April, May, and June. Tennessee's got that down. That's what it feels like every year they're doing. And it, it's this year it's led, you know, kind of reminds me of two years ago a little bit where it was led by that offense that just constantly hit balls out of the yard. It was an electric factory. Rocky Top's a really fun place to play, it looks like if you're if you're wearing the right colors. And so I, I, it kind of feels similar to, to last year to me in how good they are, how good they are offensively, and now the pitching staff is starting to figure things out. Yeah, um, I'm doing a little bit of math over here. So when you look at 2022 Tennessee Volunteers, you mentioned them a little bit on the backs of offense. 308 as a team, 158 home runs. It's two years ago. This is not that long ago. This is not 2017 when the environment was dead, right? Always factor in late in the season. Some numbers change. You face better pitchers. You stop having midweek games. All of that stuff has to be factored in here. So take this with a grain of salt. 330 as a club right now. 95 home runs on pace in the 56-game season. Now, again, they played 66 games in 2022. They are on pace to hit 204 home runs as a team in 56 games. Yeah. This is what? Insane. I mean, it's insane. It's insane. And and then just in time, here comes the pitching staff starting to, you know, we're starting to slide slot guys into roles they seem comfortable in. They're starting to figure out who they are. And that's what makes them so dangerous. Wow, two hundred and four as a club. You're fired up. If, Tennessee trends coming out. They haven't been paying if attention. They, <laughs> if they played sixty six games this year, they'd hit two hundred and forty one home runs. Wow. No, right? I just like putting it into perspective Wait, of on. like full season. What? Oh, because that's another thirty games. Yeah, they'd hit. Yeah. So yeah. They double. Sorry, I was checking your math. I was checking math because that number, it really doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel real. I I have it on a, it. so 40 games would remain. Oh, maybe I did punch it in wrong. They played 36 games. Sorry, we just made a big deal with, about this. So they have 30 games left. But I mean, it's so, okay, so it's going to be a little bit closer. So I was 10 Let's off. Let's say we're halfway. They, they, they're going to hit 200 home runs. So in 56 games, they'll hit 147. So not as crazy as it seemed. And then at 66, they will, uh, okay, good. Well, but good job 180, if they play 60 some games, it's 180 home runs, 174 home runs. If they play 66 games, so they would break that 2022 team, which was arguably the best team offensively since the BB core era, one of them at least. And they are going to outpace them slugging 50 points higher than that club did. And on getting on base at about 15 points higher. So on pace to shatter 
already impressive stats. And again, Cannon Peebles is a guy for, that they transferred in from NC State, who was a guy who they thought was going to be really good, and he hasn't been great. But everybody else has been really. I mean, Billy Amick obviously came over from Tennessee, has just lit the world on fire. He had those two home runs coming off an injury, missing a couple of weeks, and he's hitting three seventy and like. Again, Blake Burke's hitting 414 with 12 bombs. Christian Moore's hitting like the sneakiest 352 with 15 bombs in the country. Sneakiest. Like nobody talks about him, it feels like. You know what's funny? What? Clemson could really use Billy (laughs) Amick. Yeah, well, there's a reason why people leave. Like how much more dynamic that offense would be with him him in the middle of it. In college baseball, in college athletics today, there's reasons why people leave. That is not because of loyalty to your programs and the friends that you, and the relationships you've built in your two years on campus, Dan. And I'm not, I'm not confirming that Billy Amick has a check in his bank account right now from from the Volunteer Collective, but I'm pretty much assuming that NIL played a role in Billy Amick's transfer from Tennessee. Yeah, there's there's an NIL joke to be made there. Sure. Yes, so. Let's head over to the pitching side of things. You mentioned it a little bit while I was uh, typing away, trying to figure out my miscalculations for what the offense was going to do as they were putting up literally MVP baseball 2005 numbers in terms of what I was calculating. Um, create your own field, 250 all the way around high fence type style um, there. If you know, you know. That's all I got to say about that. Ten. Pitching is definitely <laughs> – Pitching is definitely still a question mark. Um, Losing A.J. Russell, who was good in his starts, but not dominant, but ton of swing and miss. Not a ton of walks, ton of swing and miss. Kind of looked like if, like, just give him more time and and he would probably turn into the ace that they expected him to be. They've had some shuffling around of their rotation. Um, Drew Beam's been pitching on Saturdays all year. AJ Causey is a guy who moved into the rotation. They decided them to have him now piggyback starter on Friday, which really worked out. Again, they won on Friday night in convincing fashion, which is really impressive. So the pitching's still taking shape. Nothing you'll ever question about Tennessee. There's certain guys in the MLB that throw 100 plus. A lot of them have come from Tennessee. Chase Burns. Yes, he threw 100 before getting to college, but he also played at Tennessee. It's a theme there. Kirby Connell's a guy in the bullpen who looks like another elite arm. 97 to 100. He's only had six walks in 18 innings pitch. If you can throw 97 to 100 in the strike zone in college baseball, that's a lot of swing and miss right there. And they have some dudes that they can rely on. But there's definitely still the question mark there that has to be answered um, and really just figured out and refined. But I think they're ultimately probably going to be okay. Yeah, I think like again, that's what we talk about. And, and credit to Tony Vitello because he did the same thing last year, where it's like he truly kind of understands that when things start in February, I'm sure he would love to be able to pencil his starting rotation in and just ride that the rest of the way, but he hasn't been able to do that. But the credit to him goes when every time around this year they start to take shape and kind of like Chase Burns coming out of the bullpen last year. To me, what Sanders Seacrest has been able to do for them kind of stabilizing things at the end of the weekend. Um, he's made eight starts and only thrown yep. 26 and two thirds. So it's not like he's pitching deep into games all the time, but just again, with, when you have an offense like this, it's like, just get us a lead. We'll patch it together the rest of the way. Just give like, just keep, keep us in the game early, you know, throw up a couple zeros. This offense is going to score. No one's going to, no one's going to shut us out. Keep us in it. And we'll we'll piece it together. And when you get to Sundays, that's what he's been able to do. And like you said, the move to to take AJ Cossey and have him pee back and be kind of the bulk innings in the middle makes a lot of sense. Go throw a reliever that again, go throw a reliever that's gonna throw up a couple, you know, two innings, max effort, throw up a couple of zeros. We'll have a four-nothing lead, then bring him in and let him throw the middle innings there, get you to the back end of your bullpen coming in with a lead like it's just like it it makes sense and if this is how they have to work it i like it i like when teams get creative because it doesn't always have to be the traditional one two three you're looking for 18 to 21 from those starters it's a lot to ask in an era where guys are operating at their maximum capacity for longer you know for long periods of time so i'm talking about starters right when we're asking guys to be max effort for five six innings it's tough it's tough at the college level we don't always have the arms to do it that doesn't mean you haven't you don't have enough good arms especially when you're pitching 
that has on a team that has an offense that Tennessee does. You you can win games, you can win conferences, you can win championships doing it. I believe that you got to have a lot of them, and you got to trust it, and everybody's got to be bought in. But how they're kind of working things, how Vitello kind of manages it, he's like. He's obviously a great recruiter, and he builds these teams with these great offenses. But what's really impressed me the last two years is the strings he's pulled midseason that has kind of sparked some things. I was yeah. critical last year when he benched the entire uh, <laughs> offense for a midweek. Like I, I was a little critical of that because to me that's like such a – it was a weird move after the Missouri series. I wasn't a huge fan of it, but – they sparked it, moving Chase Burns to the bullpen, shuffling the rotation last year, shuffling the rotation this year. You lost A.J. Russell, and like you said, he, he had only thrown 12 and a third. No, his numbers weren't outrageous. The swing and miss, the stuff looked amazing. I think he would have settled in, and he would have been your legit Friday guy. They lose him. A lot of teams, that kind of derails the season. They wouldn't be sitting here in the position that Tennessee is, talking about what feels like a slam dunk top five team. Oh, definitely a slam dunk top five team. And I think, I guess if there is anything that worries me, it seems to be a lot on the backs of a select few guys. Nate Seeds, Sneed's giving you 40 innings out of the pen. Beam's obviously starting. Causey's been between. Numbers look really good. I think the 4.75 ERA is is just a blip. But then a lot of guys, a lot, three, nine, six point two, eleven point two, three, eleven, thirty two point one. Pay yep. piece it together. Like yeah, if that's and what that, you have to do, yeah. Go do it. You're doing it to the tune yeah. of a three seven five. No, and it, that's very impressive. It's just you're one hiccup, sure. one slump away from from losing guys that have thirty plus innings and do you go to like with Russell still being out and there still being no clarity on the situation? Hopefully, hopefully it, it irons itself out because this offense is going to be fun to watch. And I want, I want this offense selfishly to play as long as possible because getting to see these five guys at the top of their lineup and Dean Curley's probably going to cross the, the double digit home run to make it six here in the next couple days. I think everybody deserves to watch this offense play for a long time. Oh, no doubt. You want to talk about LSU so, now? What else we got to do? You want to talk about I LSU mean, for a while here? <laughs> no, I mean, just is there a national championship curse? But like, I guess in the SEC. I guess. Least. Yeah. I I got nothing to say. Like I said, we're ultimately we're not going to talk about the Tigers in June. What? No. Let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Who's LSU's? I'm I'm trying to figure out what number I want you to give me because. Three, you could make an argument. That's pretty easy. Who's LSU's five best players this year? Tommy White. Absolutely. Luke Coleman. Right? Get, Offen- Luke Coleman. Does it have to be offensively? No, no, or no. Both? Luke Coleman and Tommy White are the two that, like, for sure. But, like, then, like, Definite. pitch me on pitch me on any Travinsky's of these other been Travinsky's been great. Like, I like I like what he's done. Catcher, giving you power. Um, he's had a lot, ton of big hits. Down. Jared Jones, again, same kind of same situation, a lot of strikeouts, but he has a ton of value. Um, so I'd say those three are definite. I mean, but you've Give gotten a lot of underperformance um, oh, for with, with Holman uh, as well. And then Gage Jump yeah. heading in the wrong direction has killed, like crushed them. That's what like, I mean. Crushed when them. when it was top two, and again, maybe that was us expecting too much from Jump, but – he came out the gates and he was pitching well and everybody was kind of feeling it. And now he's not pitching good at all. Um, so yeah, it's not, I mean, Malam's hitting three, three thirteen, no homers. Like he is kind of what he is slugging under 400. Just like Braswell has been good. Actually Braswell, you could probably, than, or he's under than, 450. Right. I was I got a little bit of overlap there looking at Travinsky's power numbers with Braswell. It's like, oh, that's good. And then no. So Mac Yeah, Bingham, but Braswell's I been guess, better be than he was at South Carolina offensively. Yeah. But they needed him to be but that at was least better a, than that was kind of a stretch. I felt like we knew like we watched him play in the SEC last year and saw kind of what yeah. he was. I think like the fact that he's hitting two ninety one and at least Produce a little bit. He's come up big in a couple spots early in the year. 
yeah, it's just tough. It's a tough. And again, like we we're being critical of a team that just won a national championship that recruits at the highest level that next year will be fine. But I think the problem that I have is that they do recruit at the highest level. Like that's, that's the problem yeah. I have is the fact that yeah, they, but like, I think, it, I think even... it's necessary to to work some of these guys in the year after winning a national championship. Like the the law. Now I think the thing that's so disappointing for you and I is the fact that they do recruit at the highest level and it's so bad. It's twenty two and fifteen and three and twelve in the SEC. That's what's frustrating. It's the same thing with Florida. Like if Florida's eighteen and seventeen and you also recruit at the highest level, you're in the most fertile baseball state in the country. It's kind of inexcusable. But. To even push back on that, like, yes, I agree with what you're saying, but where they have struggled is Aiden Moffitt was there last year. Griffin Herring was there last year. Gage Jump was hurt last year. Gavin Gidry, Javen Coleman, Nate, Ga- Nate Alkenhausen, Thatcher Hurd, Christian Little, Cam John, like, like Cam Johnson wasn't, he's a freshman, but like a lot of these guys were there last year. And if you could make an argument, you can make an argument that this was a problem last year on the pitching side of things. They just masked it. They had Paul Skeens, who was generational, and Ty Floyd figured it out on the back end, and Thatcher Hurd started to pitch well, and they pieced it together with a dynamic, unbelievable, historically good lineup. And that was on the backs of transfer portal. And again, I'm as big of a fan as Jay of Jay Johnson's as anybody in the country, especially with what he did at Arizona. He's always had good offenses as a guy who, who loves guys that, that have good offenses. He's got the cool little pen in the back of the hat. That kind of looks neat for anybody that looking at the YouTube people, the right way. now. Yeah. I mean, it should bother a lot of people. What What's the pen doing back there? You're supposed to be writing with it, but this is now two out of three years where LSU has again, if they had not won the national championship last year, he's had an underwhelming start to his tenure. Like I, there's no other way to say it other than the fact that like this year's been brutally bad That's when a, a national championship I, I, yes. with genera- I get- generational talents. And then the year before was, Oh, it's his transition year, which is fine. But in the transfer portal era, you're going out there, you're grabbing Tommy whites of the world. You're bringing in Paul Skeens of the world. You're bringing in Thatcher Hurd. You're bringing in all these big names, Luke Coleman, like, it's kind of inexcusable to be LSU and have a team this bad. I understand that. That's a big, uh, it's a big asterisk you're putting on it though. Like he's been a disappointment if he hadn't won a national championship. He did win the national championship. They won the national championship. I understand that generational talent, but going into the postseason last year, I don't know why I'm defending them, but going into the postseason last year, they were not the number one team in the country. They were not everyone's. It's not like they were the heavy favorites. They were one of the teams that could have won it. But Wake Forest was the one seed. They weren't the heavy favorite. And they ended up getting hot at the right time. I do agree with your point, though. Where you recruit, with the transfer portal, with the money that you have from boosters, it's it feels inexcusable to have a year as poor as this. And I know they've had a tough SEC schedule, but come on, like three and twelve, and and like honestly, two of the series, the way you look at it, like you can't you lost the Florida series at home. Mississippi State's been playing a lot better this year, but you should still be better than Mississippi State. Those two series, that's really tough. What do we – What do we? I mean, we'd feel a little bit better about them and be a little more understandable. If they had won those series, if they sweep one of those series, then you're sitting there you're going, okay, it's a down year. They're not playing great. They've played a really tough SEC schedule. This, Yeah, I mean, it's – it's. I hear you. To, to be LSU, to recruit at that level, to have the talent that you have, to have the coaching staff that you have. Yes. It's – it's tough. And to I mean, not like Wes Johnson, it's not like they replaced Wes Johnson with, this, with, with a young guy who had never been in the position before or been at the highest stage. I mean, you can't, they replaced with Nate Yeski. You get one of the best pitching coaches good. of the last, like, uh, I don't know, 15 years in college baseball. Yeah. No. And again, I'm not, it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, I, I know you said, you can't take the national championship out there out of it, but it's yeah. like you had two generational talents in college baseball. And it's like, that's the know, difference sometimes. It's with, like, yeah, but I, I mean, Cagley, you could argue Cagley and Owen and Langford were generational. Yeah. But that was a, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't Rhett, know. Rhett, I just Rhett, think Rhett Louder like, and, and Nick Kurtz were on the Wake Forest team that they beat. And Brock Wilkin. So there's definitely an argument to be made. Like that that was an impressive run, but it's been an underwhelming like 
two out of the three years have been it's been more underwhelming yes, and than I understand than your point. I was I, just nitpicking your point. Yeah. No, I was 100%. nitpicking because I could turn and, and be say like, what you want last year. You said you said there were questions about this team. They were the number one they were the number five national seed going into the into the tournament. So they they might not have been playing great baseball, but they were they were in a good position. No, no, my point was it wasn't like they were the over all I was trying to say is they weren't the yeah. overwhelming favorite going into that. Yeah, we definitely They were one of the best teams. They sat back. at one for yeah, for most of the year. Yeah. But I just think like you it's inexcusable for them to be playing this poorly, but like I don't know, Tennessee had a generational offense and has had a bunch of you know they had first round picks on the mound. They had Chase Burns, they had Dolander. It's really hard to win a national championship, I guess, is what I'm saying. So it's tough it is. for me it to, is. to to knock you if you do it to discredit that. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Any closing thoughts before we get out of here? But they need to be better. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassing that they're that bad. Did I just hear a go Tigers? Is that what you said? <laughs> go Tigers. Can't wait to talk. Closing thoughts. Can't wait to talk about LSU on the preview pod this weekend. Who do they got next weekend? I don't even know. <laughs> I've, stopped, I've stopped looking. Fair. As you should, because this team is not playing. Again, Maybe they get going, but we said that this past we said that back to back weekends. Like, would you be surprised if they sweep Vanderbilt? They get they get beat up. Would you be surprised if they sweep Tennessee? No, they get beat up. So now we're gonna say, would you be surprised if they win a game this weekend? Yes, and they're gonna sweep. So, all right. Well, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. As that will conclude our episode for today. Make sure you're subscribing to the podcast on all podcast platforms, including Apple Pods, Spotify, and anywhere you find your podcast. We post episodes weekly, always hitting your feed at 7 a.m. sharp. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at BacksideGB, Instagram at BacksideGroundBalls, and TikTok at BacksideGroundBall. And make sure, most importantly, make sure you're sharing with five friends. We'll see you next time on the Backside Ground Balls podcast.